so let me take you back to my youth. Uh, so when I was young, I was privileged to go to two primary schools. I went to Nakasero Primary School and I went to Kampala Parents Primary School. But one thing that was constant in the schools was that all children of native descent had to cut their hair down to a few centimeters. So whether you liked it or not, your hair had to be a few centimeters short. Whereas those of Indian descent or those who are mixed race, or if you had a special disease, you could keep your hair for a while, for long. So I thought this only stopped with primary school, and I thought after Ayaz, as society went on developing, we would eventually evolve past this colonial rule, because it is from colonial era, but we'll revisit that later. So what happened was children across the country were complaining. In Nabisunsa Girls School, it's a very popular and very excellent girls school here in Uganda, girls complained about discrimination. They asked, why is it that only us, only the Ugandans, only the black Africans have to cut off our hair? Why can't everybody else, since it's school uniform, cut their hair down to centimeters? And the school said it was because of hygiene. Actually, when they interviewed one of the people who she is for, she's of Yemeni descent, in this article, one of them, she mentioned that the students had dirty hair because they couldn't comb it. And so since they had lice, they had to cut it off. But when you look at the science of things, it's very hard for African natural hair to get lice. To, as compared to more straight hair. So this begs a question, why are we upholding things that were set before we were born that don't work in our favor? What is happening is over time, we are raising generations of ladies who do not know how to do the most basic thing, that is take care of the own hair that grows out of your follicles all the time. So we had an incident in Pretoria where girls were complaining and it was a huge protest in the whole country. The media was in uproar and the girls were saying that the school told them to either straighten their hair or cut it off. But our hair, the moment if you've been to a hair salon and you have kinky coily curly hair, it takes two minutes out in the sun for your hair to shrink back. So all the time, if you spend six hours in a salon, will have been wasted in trying to reach for beauty ideals that are not naturally our own. So the thing is we're actually wasting resources. So moving on, we notice that girls can be taught from when they are young, like how you share with them about their identity and their hair and their belonging, all the way from the dolls they carry. If she's carrying a blonde, Barbie doll, it influences how she sees herself because in her mind she will try to aspire to have hair that can have a comb go through, you know, to easily braid her tresses that like to coil instead. So usually we have even three-year-olds asking, but I'm not beautiful, I'm not pretty, my hair doesn't do what Barbie's hair does. This is because we are not representing ourselves in the best way possible. So we do have stable beauty ideals that work in our favor. One thing about our natural hair is that the good thing, it didn't start with us, right? Our grandparents had it, their grandparents had it. Since the beginning of time, there was someone with natural hair out there. So in society, if you can see this clearly, hair had a purpose. Hair in African traditional society, hair identified your status. It contribution to community. It showed who you were in a gathering of people. You are a lord, you are a farmer, you are a hunter, you are a warrior. It told a story of identity, of who we were, and who supposed to co as how we're supposed to contribute in society. So hair was more than just a disposable thing that we cut off and throw over there. It was something that meant something. During the colonial era, an idea was got 
to cut off all the hair, especially in our more traditional schools. The big schools we have here in Uganda, Budo, Nabi, Namiryango, Namagunga, those are the most commonly known or the school's parents strive to take children to. These were Christian-led schools where you knew a child would get good morals, get good education, they'd have a classy and more wholesome upbringing. But the one thing that was set in most of these schools was all hair had to be cut off. So the classroom was down to the same playing ground. So there were no lords or ladies or hunters or gatherers. There was no identifier of who you were and your contribution in society. But this took away from us because it meant that over time, we let go of our identity. We let go of the meaning of a fabric of our society, something that identifies us, something that grows naturally out of us. Going forward, we have noticed that now in Uganda, so many women are going back to natural hair. We find office lords in my shop, they come as a bunch of 30 or 20 women, and they're like, you know what? I'm done with into natural hair. So the thing is, when they jump back, they are met with a new challenge. Who here has heard of the word kaweke? Who has heard of type 4 hair? There is an ongoing classism and sort of, I would like to call it colorism, but in the hair group, where we classify some hair as good hair and some hair as undesirable hair. But this brings an effect. It brings a negative connotation to the one who has hair that is not so desirable. Oh, my hair is hard. It's unmanageable. It is kaweke. But kaweke is coily. It is happy in its shrinkage. If you feed it water, it smiles, it blooms. We have to change the way we talk about who we are naturally. We have to stop editing ourselves to fit Eurocentric standards of beauty and meet ourselves in the mirror and say, hey, oh, that's you. Oh, you're beautiful. Oh, I like you. So it takes a while, but it also takes a personal visitation of everybody in this room here. And it's not so easy work. It is actually hard work. It's work that's necessary. It's work that we must do because it is affecting how we're looking at society. The beauty industry in Africa is, in 2017 of April was estimated to be about $25.4 billion. That's a lot of money that we put into these products, that we put into the service providers. And if that money is coming from, from our pockets, then we should be able to say where we want the attention to go. We should be able to direct the industry based on our needs, right? Right? Right. So in Ghana, Nivea released an ad where they were launching a new product, and it was um, a product for visibly fairer skin. But the thing is, in Ghana, they have a huge love for their melanin. There's a huge pro-African trend in Kumasi itself, whereby they just cannot see things and stay silent. There was a huge uproar on Twitter. People were crazy on social media. They were angry. They were furious with Nivea. They're like, we do not want fairer skin. We love our melanin. We love the diverse colors that come with being an African. And that ad was taken down. If that ad was in Uganda, would it have been taken? Why is it that it's easier for you to carry fair and lovely, that's a cosmetic that bleaches, into school? It's much easier for you to carry fair and lovely than to carry shea butter into school. Have you thought about that? So that means we are silently condoning and agreeing to certain standards. In a, ne in a continent that is the most diverse in the world, why do we want to look like a beige, smooth-haired lady with almond eyes? I we all want to look the same thing. Why? 
We are diverse, we're tall, we're dark, we're light, we're beautiful, we're freckled, we have smooth skin, we have dimples, we don't have dimples, we have wide nose, we have slim nose. We are diverse and that's how beautiful we are. It's the tapestry of our ancestry, you know? It's our lineage. That hair you have was your grandmother's hair, you know? That skin you have was your grandfather's skin. So what are you trying to what are you trying to say about him? Moving on to what it means to be economically independent and to own our own pockets and to put money back to the hands of Africans. We opened Emberi Emberi Nature Shop. So Emberi Nature Shop has, shop and saloon have been there for around two and a half years, just over that. And We've worked with more than 30 African beauty brands. These beauty brands have impacted more than 250 other brands. We're talking suppliers, farmers, uh, graphic designers, all these other people that come with setting up a business entity, just as in Virginia Natural. These 30 beauty brands are 99% women-led. This means when the money goes to a woman, it builds a nation, right? Right? Yes. The beauty brands not only have impacted more than 250 other brands, but they have also given birth to other businesses. So if someone has run a business for three years, they usually set up something else so they can supplement the income of the family. So it's providing a source of capital for these people. What would happen if everyone in this room had a profitable business that employed about eight people or more. And that business paid tax, and that business paid salaries, and that business provide, provided hope and, and, and just freedom to the people of this country. It would be revolutionary, right? So through our work with the Virisa Natural, not only do we share healthy beauty, that means non-cancerous, non-toxic beauty products, guilt-free, also means that we get to impact a life. We've had more than 20,000 customers in just over two and a half years. And most of those customers, I'm saying 80% of them are return customers who bring their family and their friends and their colleagues. So my challenge or my encouragement to you is let's stop looking outside and start looking in. The opportunities are here, 25.4 billion on the African continent alone. So, count also those in the diaspora. Count also those other people. Because the thing is, in Embryo Natural, we believe that we make healthy beauty, made in Africa, by Africans, for everyone.